Uh, hi, I'm Sophia Wong from the University of Washington. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the joint work with my collaborators at the University of Washington. So uh, the web is the critical part of the internet. We can see that there are many applications include, including Maps, uh, Microsoft Office, and Facebook, uh, the social network, are now all on the web. So page load Page load is critical. Uh, PPS has previously reviewed uh, some numbers like this, like Amazon can increase one percent avenue by decreasing page load time by 100 milliseconds. However, page load is slow. From our own measurement study, we find that the, uh, the median page load time is as much as three seconds for the top 200 web pages. And a few web pages even take more than 10 seconds to load. So to this end, there have been many optimization techniques that try to improve page load time. So for example, mod, sp mod page speed, uh, what it does is it, uh, it enforces a list of best practices uh, by converting web pages. And for example, uh, caching and CDNs that try to uh, improve locality, and uh, speedy that replaces uh, HTTP at the application level. So given so many optimization techniques, it is still unclear whether they help or hurt or under what circumstances and, what, and, and how much. Uh, the reason for this is that uh, the page load time depends on so many factors. So for example, on the network side, page load time depends on RTT bandwidth locality. And on the computational side, it depends on CPU or even what kind of JavaScript engine you use. So uh, the result is that an optimization uh, technique often only improves part of the factors, but not all. So it is important to evaluate an optimization technique in the context of the page load process. However, the page load process is poorly understood. Uh, I'm going to give an example that, that shows how, why it is difficult to understand. So here we have two simple web pages. In the first page, it embeds first a JavaScript and then uh, an image. And on the second page, it first embeds an image and then a JavaScript. So we would expect that the two, because the two pages will look exactly the same on the browser, so we would expect that the page load time of the two pages would be the same. Uh, now we look at uh, how much time it will take to load the, pa the pages. For the first page, uh, the, the blue bar here means uh, the time to load the HTML, and the yellow bar means uh, time to load the JavaScript, and the purple bar means time to load the image. So we can see that loading this image needs to wait until the JavaScript is loaded. However, for, for the second page, we see that loading this JavaScript does not have to wait until the, until the image is loaded. So if you are familiar with uh, mechanisms like preloading, here we assume that preloading is not used. So the result is that uh, the second page is loaded faster than the first page. So these, this example also tells that understanding the dependencies between different factors is the key to understand page loads. So here is an outline of the rest of the talk. Uh, I will first tell about uh, how we model the page load dependencies uh, with a focus on how to extract dependency. And then uh, with this list of dependencies, uh, we, we, we embed them in a, in, a, in a tool that can automatically profile dependencies while loading web pages. And then we will, uh, we will tell about the study that we, that we do on uh, while, while performing real page loads using this tool. And last, I will uh, include, some, include some measurements result on Speedy that we have recently done. Now let's look at uh, how we model the page load dependency. Our methodology is as follow. We first reverse engineer with test pages, and we also examine browser document as well as inspect browser code when open source is available. And note that no single source provides a comprehensive view of dependencies, but rather they complement each other. 
So in the rest of the talk, I will only talk about how we reverse engineer with test pages. Uh, so here is an uh, example of the embedding graph of a web page. So on this graph, we have an HTML that first embeds a, Java, a JavaScript an image and a CSS. And then the JavaScript uh, in turn uh, embeds an image and an HTML. So there are two kinds of, inf uh, two kinds of re relationship between two objects. The first kind is uh, that an object follows another. In this case, uh, the image follows this JavaScript and the CSS follows this image. The other relationship is that an object embeds another. So here we see that uh, the JavaScript embeds an image. So what we do to design the test pages is that we consider all pairwise objects of, of any kinds uh, of these two relationships. After obtaining uh, a list of test pages, um, what we do is we load these test pages uh, from different browsers and observe the timings using developer tools. Uh, for example, these two, uh, for these two pages that we previously shown, uh, we, uh, this image depend, uh, loading this image depends on loading this JavaScript. And for the second page, we find that loading this JavaScript does not have to, does not depend on loading this image. So using this uh, methodology and as well as uh, looking at the browser code and examining documentation, we obtain a list of dependency policies and then we categorize, categorize them into four categories. So for the first category, which is what we call uh, flow dependency, what it means is that it, it, it represents the natural order that activities occur. And the second category is what we call output dependency. It ensures the correctness of execution with multiple components access to the same resource. I will give an example later uh, on what, what this means. And the third kind of uh, dependency policy is lazy and eager binding. It, it is a result of the trade-offs between data downloads and page load latencies. For example, sometimes we can um, specu speculatively preload some, uh, some objects which could not be used later. And the last dependency is, dep kind of dependency is resource constraint, which is a result of limited computing power or network resources. Uh, for example, the major browsers cap the number of TCP connections to six. So if we, may, if we make the seventh request, it needs to wait until one, a previous one is, is finished. Uh, now I'm going to talk about an example of output dependency. So here we have a simple web page. Uh, it contains, it embeds, a, it embeds a CSS and then a JavaScript. So what I'm going to show below is uh, an ar architecture of browsers. Uh, basically, there are four components here, uh, an object loader, HTML parser, uh, evaluator, JavaScript and CSS evaluator, and renderer. And on the top right, I'm going to show the water waterfall graph and the, how these activities uh, are interdependent. So first of all, uh, we, we go through the first activities. That is, when the HTML is loaded, we start to parse the page. When it gets to the CSS tab, uh, the CSS is fetched and, and is sent to evaluation. So while the CSS is being loaded and evaluated, HTML continues parsing until it gets to the JavaScript tab. And then HTML stops parsing, and then JavaScript is loaded and then evaluated. So we see that the JavaScript is not evaluated immediately, immediately after it is loaded, but rather it is evaluated after the CSS is evaluated. So why is, why is it the case? It's because both CSS evaluation and JavaScript, JavaScript evaluation can modify the DOM styles so that they cannot happen at the same time, and the order is important here. After JavaScript finishes evalu evaluation, HTML parsing is resumed. 
So here it's the similar case that uh, JavaScript evaluation and HTML parsing cannot happen at the same time because both can access to the DOM. So, uh, so the two red arrows here uh, represent the output dependency. And we can see that uh, for, the kind of, for the kind of JavaScript that we block the HTML parsing, uh, we call bar parsing blocking JavaScript. And uh, uh, so in HTML5, we can basically make it asynchronized. So for our best practice, we expect that, we expect that all the external JavaScript should be as asynchronous or, or, uh, or, be co or converted in line. So, uh, with the so with the list of dependency policies, we built a tool on top of real browsers and uh, uh, to profile the dependencies while loading real pages. So we call the tool wprof. So what we do is we modify the native browser and uh, add a shim layer uh, that sits on top of the different browser components. So this profiler will output uh, activity timings and uh, dependencies. Note that we don't uh, work at the browser extension or plugin level because they don't, uh, they can't give us enough, in enough information. So our implementation of this profiler is built on, uh, is built on WebKit and we also extend it to uh, Chrome and Safari. It is written in C++. Uh, so, in offline, we, uh, we, we, we can generate dependency graphs from what we output from this W prof profiler. And by performing what we say a critical path analysis, we can identify the bottleneck path of loading a page. So here is the dependency graph of the example we previously talked about. So even for a simple page like, like this, the dependency graph is not like non-trivial. And then uh, let me talk about how we, how we define critical path analysis. So for our example here, we start from the last activity and, uh, move, it, and move it backward to the first one, which is this path. So what this means is that uh, if, we improve, if, we, if we improve an activity on the critical path, the page load time is likely to be improved. But if we improve an activity that is not on the critical path, the page load time is likely uh, should not be improved. So here, for example, if we improve loading this JavaScript, the page load time will not be improved. Uh, now, let me give you some results on uh, using this tool to loading real web pages. Here is the setup. Uh, we, we set up a client at at the campus network of the University of Washington. And on the client, we run a WPROF instru instrumented Chrome browser. And we experimented with 150 out of the 200 web pages. Uh, we exclu excluded some pages because the Selenium web driver we use will cause some handbags. So for each web page, we, we, loaded, we loaded for five times and look at the minimum in our result. Seems like I can click something on. Okay, great. So we're, we try to answer questions using our tool. So the first question we try to, try to answer is, how much does computation contribute to page load time? So we ask this question because some people believe that page load time is all about network and some other people believe that page load time is all about computation. So without this notion of, depend of dependencies it is uh, and critical path, it is, hard to, uh, it is hard to answer this question. But now we have this tool and we're able to answer it. So uh, this, is the, this is our result. The x-axis shows the network and computation as a fraction of page load time. And the y-axis is the cumulative distribution function, which means that each 
each data point here means a web page. So this graph tells that in the median case, computation is as much as 35% of page load time on the critical path, which means that computation cannot be ignored. So this also tells that um, for protocols like Speedy, it can, it can basically uh, only help the network portion, but it cannot help the computational portion. Another question we want to ask is, how much does caching help page load time? Well, expectedly, caching can help a lot. So what we do is um, we first load a page uh, without, with, with clearing all the cache, and then we immediately load it again. So we compare the second load with the first load. We find that uh, caching eliminates 80% 80, 80 of the web object loads, uh, which is a lot. However, we find that it doesn't reduce page load time as much. So why is it the case? It is because we find that caching only eliminates 40% of web objects load on the critical path, which means that if we cache the, cache the objects that are off the critical path, it's not going to help page load time. Uh, there are also other findings, so I will not talk, talk about them in detail. Uh, so the first one is that uh, there, we find that there are 60% there are of the top pages that have parsing blocking JavaScript. Well, expectedly, we hope that parsing blocking JavaScript are, should be eliminated. And also find that uh, we also break down the network time on the critical path and find that uh, DNS lookup time is significant. We, fur we further break up the computational time on the critical path and find that uh, the time is mostly spent, spent on HTML parsing and some spent on JavaScript evaluation and very little spent on CSS evaluation. Uh, last, I'm going to talk about our uh, recent measurement studies on Speedy. So Ilya has talked about some preliminaries on Speedy. So I want to ask how many of you knows what Speedy does? Okay, about like over a half or something. So I'm going to briefly talk about what Speedy does. So it first multiplexes HTTP data into a single TCP connection. So currently, browsers will open multiple TCP connections to transfer uh, a data to a single domain. It can also prioritize web objects. It, allow, it, al it allows servers to initiate web object transfers, uh, which is server push, instead of asking the client to strictly uh, initiate web requests. You can also compress headers, not only HTTP payload. So uh, it, is hard to, it is hard to analytically study, uh, analyze how much speedy helps on a circumstance. So, there are, many, there are many studies in this space. However, what's interesting is that we find, these, we find these studies sometimes conflicting with each other. So we assume that probably these studies only look at a part of the parameters that, uh, that affect speedy performance. So in this case, we think that a systematic study is necessary to understand, speedy perf to understand speedy's benefits. So this is why we do this. So we want to do a systematic study to Speedy. There are some challenges uh, in understanding Speedy performance, and here also provide our approaches. The first challenge is that there are many factors that are external to Speedy which can actually affect Speedy performance. For example, uh, computation. So what we do is we isolate the contributing factors to Speedy. And the second challenge is that the page load time is largely varied. To this case, if we, to this end, if we want to, uh, if we want to get some, um, real, uh, get some convincing result, we need to repeat experiments for lots of times. So to get rid of this, uh, what we do is we control this variability. To control the variability in computation, uh, we use our own developed emulators instead of browsers. To control variability in network, we experiment under a fully controlled network. 
And the third challenge is that there are dependencies between network, between network and computation that can significantly affect page load time. So in our experiment, we consider the real page load process. Here is how our experiments proceed. Uh, we start with synthetic web pages, and then we consider the real page statistics uh, without considering computation and dependency. And last, we consider computation and dependency, in which case we say we, cons uh, we experiment under the real web page load process. Now let's look at the first synthetic web page experiments. Uh, what we do here is that we make HTTP requests to web objects at the same time uh, and ignore the effects of web, page, uh, web pages. Uh, we look at these factors, uh, RTT bandwidth, uh, packet loss rate, and TCP initial window. We also uh, tune the, the web object size and number of ob objects. For example, if we say that if we load a web page with uh, with eight, with eight objects uh, of size 10K. So what we do is we make HTTP request to these eight, these eight objects uh, of 10K, and uh, we define page load. We define page load time as follows, um, which is the time between when we make the first HTTP request to the first object uh, and when we receive the last object. And we perform five rounds for one combination and look at the minimum. Or look at the median. So um, after obtaining the multidimensional data, what we do is to answer the question of when speedy helps or hurts. So we use decision tree analysis to this end because it tells exactly when speedy helps or hurts. Uh, so for a data item, it, it has a value r and a, feature, and a list of features. The r means the page load time of speedy divided by that of HTTP. And if r is more than 1.1, it means that HTTP is better. If r is less than 0.9, it means that uh, speedy is better. And if it's the rest of the case, it means that speedy and HTTP are about equal. So here is the is the decision tree we obtain. So, so on this path, it basically means that speedy helps on small web objects. So the reason is basically because, uh, because of how speedy is implemented. So in speedy, uh, one TCP segment can carry multiple web objects, which means that, for example, uh, if, there are, if there are 10 web objects of size 100 bytes. We can only, Speedy can, u can use only one TCP segment to carry them. But in HTTP, we need to use 10 TCP segments to carry them. Uh, so the result is that, uh, the result is that uh, TCP, TCP congestion control is done at the level of packets. So, so if we, if we have 10 very small packets, it will be delivered in more than in more than uh, one RTT if the initial window is less than 10. So what this means is that if we have a, if, 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 if our web page have, have lots of small images, we don't have to use, uh, we don't have to use CSS sprites. And the other two paths uh, shows that Speedy helps under large objects under low packet loss rate. And this is due to uh, the benefits of a single TCP connection. So recall that uh, in HTTP, when there are multiple TCP connections, um, they, can, they can compete with each other and, and then result in, uh, in some retransmissions. But if we only have one TCP connection, there, there will be no competition and therefore less retransmissions. There is one case in which speedy hurts, that is, on large objects under high packet loss rate. So it is also due to a single TCP connection. So recall that like most of the TCP variants control the control do does, uh, do congestion control by by observing packet loss. So what what they do is basically uh, when it observes a 
a packet loss, it will back off, back off the window size, uh, for example, by half. So in Speedy, if there is a packet loss, um, it will back off congestion window by half. But in HTTP, when there are, for example, six uh, concurrent TCP connection, only one of them backs off this uh, congestion window by half. So the result is that Speedy backs off congestion window more aggressively than, uh, than HTTP. So to this end, what we, what we do to verify that uh, this, can be, this can get mitigated, uh, we also modify the, modify the Linux kernel uh, and change, change the congestion control to let Speedy to let, speedy, uh, to, to let TCP back off less aggressively uh, using Speedy, we find that this can be mitigated. Uh, now we move to the statistics of real web pages. Because previously we assumed some unre probably unrealistic numbers of uh, the number of objects on the page and the, ob and the object size. So now we look at uh, the statistics about real web pages. <coughs> Uh, here, we still make HTTP requests, and our definition of page load time remains, remains the same. And, but we consider the web object size, sizes and numbers of the top 200 web pages. What we find is as the follow. So uh, the x-axis is uh, page load time of Speedy divided by page load time of HTTP. If it, if it is less than one, it means that Speedy helps. If it more than one, it means that uh, HTTP helps. And the uh, data points here means, uh, means a page load. It, it is a cumulative distribu distribution function. It basically says that uh, under these parameters, Speedy helps up to 60% in the median case, which is, which is a lot. We also have done experiments uh, using other parameters, and Speedy still helps like around a half, which is still a lot. So then we proceed to the real page load process scenario in which uh, we consider the dependencies and the computation. So um, traditionally, when we consider the real page load process, uh, we load the we load these pages uh, using real browsers. But in that way, we, it will cause large variations of page load time. So we try to control this by, our, by, by emulating the page load process uh, using uh, a tool we call epload. So what epload does is that it first uh, record the page load process by capturing the de dependency graph by the tool that I had previously talked about. And then, in the re in the re replaying process, um, in the replaying phase, it walks through the de dependency graph. When it encounters a network activity, it makes real H real network request. And when it encounters a computational activity, it just waits for the amount of time that computation takes. So in this way, we con we control the variability from computation. We also experiment under a fully controlled network so that we control basically all the variability. So here is the result by considering uh, computation and dependencies. It's basically the same graph, but we can see that by adding computation and dependency, Speedy helps much less. So uh, this basically tells that uh, dependency and computation can easily overwhelm what Speedy can help. And uh, this is an example from a good network, which is about 20 millisecond RTT. And uh, for experiments under bad network, like a, a 200 millisecond RTT, Speedy can actually help more, uh, between like 10% to 20%. Uh, the reason is that in, uh, under a bad network, uh, the computation is a lesser fraction of the total page load time. So then uh, we considered how to improve Speedy. Uh, previously, we say that we can mitigate the, the negative impact of, of a single connection uh, by, by tuning TCP or using the quick protocol that uh, Ilya has talked about. And now we try to we try to we try to understand whether uh, speedy mechanisms like prioritization and server push can help mitigate negative impact from dependencies and computation. 
we first experiment with prioritization and find that prioritization actually doesn't help much. So we try to find out the reason and find that the priorities has priorities have already embedded in the dependency graph. So what this means is that uh, if we load a web page, uh, definitely the, the root HTML page is the most important. And in the dependency graph, it basically says that all the other objects cannot be loaded until the HTML page is loaded, which means that there, there, is, depend, there is prioritization implicitly embedded in the dependency graph. So explicitly assigned priorities helps very, very little. And this is also what we say that prioritization doesn't break the dependency graph. It's why it doesn't help as much. Now for the case of server push, we find that server push can help a lot, even if we just push uh, one level of, of the objects. The reason is that server push can break the dependency graph so that some objects later does not have to wait until a previous object is loaded. Uh, here is the conclusion. We find that the page load time is poorly understood. And so the result is that it is hard to propose effective techniques to improve page load time. And to this end, we demystified page load performance. We find that both computation and network are significant to page load time. We also find that caching does not help as much as, as expected on the critical paths. By experimenting with Speedy, we find that Speedy can help a lot if we ignore the, ignore the effect of dependencies and computation, but it helps little if, uh, if we consider the effect of dependency and computation. Uh, that is basically my talk, and uh, uh, we also have a web page that will uh, update the latest tool and results we, we have. And thank you. Any thank questions? And Sophia is here. If you, have any, uh, if you have any questions for her, she's available here. Um, this is from Yahoo for you. So next up, we have a panel discussion on high performance in mobile. So give us two minutes. We'll just get uh, started here.